Hey everyone, welcome to On Purpose, the number one health podcast in the world. Thanks to each and every one of you. Thank you for coming back every single week to listen, to learn, to grow. And I just wanna say, I'm so grateful that you take out time every week out of your schedules, whether you're walking your dog, whether you're cooking, whether you're commuting, whether you're working or editing right now, I just want to thank you for taking out time to choose education. The fact that you're choosing to learn, choosing to develop yourselves, this is the right place to be. And today's guest is someone that I've been fascinated for so many years. We've had the fortune of having incredible curious conversations together and today we actually get to video it and record it on audio so that you can witness it too. He's truly got one of the most fascinating minds I've ever met. The first meeting I had with him was nothing short of brilliant. And I just want to tell you a bit about him. Now listen very, very carefully. Brian Grazer is an Academy Award winning producer, New York Times, a best-selling author of A Curious Mind, who's been making movies and television programs for more than 25 years. His credits include, and this is just the tiniest list in the world, uh, A Beautiful Mind, 24, Arrested Development, Empire, Eight Mile, Friday Night Lights, amongst so many others. His films and TV series have been nominated, wait for this, 43 Academy Awards and 195 Emmys. And Brian's new book, Face to Face, is what we're talking about today. It's the art of human connection, something I know is so important to every one of you. So please welcome to the show, Brian Grazer. Brian, thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm so grateful to have you here. Thank you, of course. This is such a pleasure and honor to be sitting with you. I'm psyched. Yeah, I was really psyched. <laughs> we both just got back from our vacations only last night. I, I was know. back from Provence and got up early, and you were back from, am I allowed to say Bora Bora? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> absolutely. I was on a three-year late honeymoon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're very busy then. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But I want to kick this off by asking yes. a curious question of my own. And I know curious conversations are your fascination. Yes. But you're actually a painter. Yes. Like, that's something that you dabble in. Tell us about how you got involved in that. Um, I got involved in painting through my daughter. My daughter was only, her name is Sage. She was three, four years old. At three, I was playing invisible Barbies with her, (laughs) where you're playing with a Barbie and then she takes the Barbie away and she goes, well, the Barbie's now got red hair. And I go, I can't see the Barbie. She says, well, it's invisible. So I thought I have to transition her to something that I, maybe we could do together, you know, because that was, I was looking at my watch. So I think at now five years old, we decided we'd paint together. Uh, which is something I've never done. I don't, uh, I've never played with ceramics or painted or anything before. And uh, so I had room to have an art studio and we became painters together. And she soon ceased to paint and I just continued to paint and still do to this day paint. And I use um, primarily acrylic, then oil, and then oil stick and often pencil to highlight or punctuate faces faces or usually faces uh nuance amazing expression so painting is what brought your human connection together yes painting is what brought our human connection together and we became like completely embedded with one another on this (laughs) painting and tell me tell me about that what is when you say the art of human connection what is human connection to brian grazer like what does that mean to you um, it means, well, first, it, it, okay, first there's the, the set point of human connection, which begins with eye contact. And, um, and, and, and there's a whole story about eye contact and why I became, uh, had a heightened awareness to it. Um, but um, basically, it, human connection begins with looking at, actually looking at somebody, but looking at somebody calmly and uh, without ambition. Just looking at them calmly and feeling them. Doesn't mean you have to pause, doesn't have, you have to do any weird thing, but you just have to really look at them and, and be relaxed and be interested. And that makes somebody feel like it validates them as a human being, it makes them feel human. And conversely, you will feel human. So it just begins with that generous act. Now, once you've established that, you're at least on the very, very beginning of the pathway to getting to know somebody, to getting to ask questions, for them to feel like I can answer those questions. And once you're on the pathway, then you can 
really just let biology take over, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and and you find things that are very interesting about them, they with you. But what I'm personally interested in doing is getting to the place where we both are, you know, on a one-on-one, we're both reaching into our, our most authentic self. Yeah. Where whatever that truth is that lies deep embedded in you, whatever that is, to have some of that reveal. And I do this now all, always without any thought about it. And and there is a pluses and minuses to this. And I always tell people it's like you when you're reaching inside of yourself and you're really accessing that you do say things that are stupid <laughs> and you make mistakes you're fallible you're and you're you have to say i'm willing to have that fallibility in myself happen and, but if somebody feels your soul they forgive that and they often really enjoy it and they it usually becomes the thing that is part of the connective tissue in this connection that you're having that was bridged through just this initial set point of looking at something Wow, that's unbelievable. I don't think I'm ever going to look at someone the same ever again after that definition. Everyone's always asking me, Jay, where do you get your information? Where do you learn? Where do you study? Where do you read? And I know how difficult it is to find quality journalism and places where there are deeper perspectives and interesting points of view about what's happening in the world out there. And that's why I'm so excited to tell you about Quartz. Quartz provides global news and insights for our generation of business leaders. If you're someone who wants to learn on the go, always be consuming information that's actually going to be useful to you in meetings, at events, and in the content you're creating, then Quartz is a great place to start. It was founded in 2012 and features creative and innovative journalism and looks at broad points of view across the world of business. And what I really love about Quartz is that they have 230 people across the globe being able to provide different world views on what's happening. So you're getting this refreshing perspective from diverse backgrounds and all walks of life. A Quartz membership is far more than just a subscription. It's really an invite to a community of future business leaders. When you become a member, not only do you get access to the award-winning journalism, you also get invited to in-person events and get to take part in these awesome conversations around topics you believe in. I really loved their video interview with Bill Gates where he talked about how he would learn and develop himself if he was 15 years old again. Now that was fascinating. If you want to get 25% off your membership right now, go to qz.com and use the code on purpose. That's qz.com and use the code on purpose and qz.com if you're in the US. Again, use the code on purpose. Enjoy. So we can pretty much do everything on the internet. Search engines like Google or Bing or whatever it may be, you can ask pretty much any question to. But when it comes to drafting legal agreements or when it comes to reviewing a contract or anything that requires some sort of legal expertise, it's hard to find that. Now if you've been looking for good legal counsel or if you've been looking for good legal advice, then Biz Counsel is your place. For just $89 a month, you get an attorney that learns about you and your business. And literally, anytime you have any question or you wanna draft an agreement or whatever it may be for your business, you can just pick up the phone and ask them for their advice. So whether that's today, tomorrow, yesterday, or next month, all you can do is pick up the phone and get that advice right away. Now, that means you don't have to pay by the hour. You're paying your $89 a month. It's one of those things that just gives you peace of mind and simplicity and saves money. Now it's time to get a dedicated business attorney by your side. You can focus on building the brand, building the business, and focusing on the momentum, and they can build the legal side of your business, which is very, very important and shouldn't be forgotten. So for my listeners, you can get a month for free by going to bizcouncil.com forward slash J to get a month absolutely free. So that's bizcouncil.com. So that's B-I-Z-C-O-U-N-S-E-L.com forward slash J. And in that $89 a month, you get two contract reviews included as well. Go check out Biz Council and see how it can support your business. That's amazing. The part that I really picked up on listening to you that really connected with me was without ambition. Oh, okay. I think that's such a beautiful point. I've always felt one of the reasons why from my monk experience that I benefited so much is I felt I spent time with people who had no agenda for me. Yes. And like being around someone who has yeah. no agenda for you, who doesn't want anything from you or isn't trying to manipulate. And this is what I find fascinating about when you talk about it in this book, 
and, and for anyone who's going to read the book afterwards, this is what I find fascinating about the way you present it. It's not a technique or a tactic for you. No. It's not like this manipulative strategy for you. No. It's like a very genuine, authentic, what you just mentioned there. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. How do you help people live it in that way as opposed to like, oh, Brian's told me I'm going to use this tactic to get use it as a way of getting it. How have you come to that place of realizing that human connection is beyond tactics and strategies yeah. and sales? That's such a great question. It's a great question, and I have a couple funny answers. Well, one is I've had people even recently, you, you know, um, you, you know, given like by movie and television success, they go, "Wow, what a great strategy!" Yeah, I go, "That wasn't a strategy. It's just what happened." I have no strategy. <laughs> I mean, I have desires, uh, and I have um, there's intentionality. Uh, within the movies and television and, the th and, and just my actions, there's intentionality. Um, and and that's sort of the beauty of it, of it all, like that intentionality leads you, is, is, is fired up by something and it leads you someplace. Okay, so let me go back <laughs> to your original question. So I found that very early in my career, I had, um, it was just right before I ever produced anything. So I, I had to be, just about turning 24 because I turned I produced something at 24 but I was dying to meet this guy who ran movies and television for CBS I'll even say his name his name was Donald March and I wanted to meet Donald March and he knew me and I called him once and it took him like at least two weeks to call me back so I thought if I could get into this big Hollywood party then Donald March and people like Donald March will call me right back so I found that first of all, I was in, I did get in. I found that I was incredibly uncomfortable being at this party. And I felt that it was a plan, it was a construction. It was like very artificial to me. So I did see Donald March. This is really true. And I totally screwed it up. <laughs> and I, t I got to the, I screwed it up like because I was nervous, I was out of my honest real zone. And he literally never called me back ever again. Wow. <laughs> just because I said, Stu you know, it just didn't feel right, you know? Yeah. And people can feel when things are not, uh, that, aren't, that aren't real. They can feel constructions. Absolutely. Particularly if you're paying attention. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I kind of vowed at that time that I was never going to go to, to any party as an ambition. I would go if I thought I could have a good time. I thought if I could be naturalistic and just like, this could be really fun or this could be a really interesting experience or this could be a really interesting adventure when it's just a, re when it becomes a real thing that I'm doing. But when it becomes like, you know, uh, recently someone said, fly to Saudi and have this one meeting. And I thought, that's not me. <laughs> I ended up going to Saudi incidentally and had this an unbelievably wild experience, but, and which was incredibly valuable, but I couldn't go in surgical as a surgical ambitious strike, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I just don't think it works. Yeah, no, so, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, it's so funny. I was just saying before this podcast, I was talking to my team and I was just saying, for me, every podcast is a genuine conversation. Yeah. I can't approach it with like, oh, I've got to make sure like we have to ask this to get this answer. And like, when you start constructing it like that, it's like you lose the conversation. So yeah. what to speak of business and meetings and TV yeah. and movies. It's like anything that's artificially constructed. No, I, I absolutely yeah. love that. And, and oh, go on. And please, I had please, this please, other yeah. flashpoint thought when you said it's a conversation that it made me think of this. It was my instinct about that party stuff was further ratified when I had to give a speech to all the firemen in America, all the fire captains in America after, after having produced a movie about firemen called Backdraft with uh, Billy Baldwin and Robert De Niro and several others. And um, we were in Washington, D.C. And and we had to each say something, you know, the, the director, Ron Howard, um, and the chairman of the studio had to speak. And the chairman of the studio was really very high intellect, you know, very high IQ, very high intellect very articulate very very and he came walked out on stage right before me and i thought wow what's this big brain gonna do and you know what he did he froze and he basically said things that were like a speech 
and got no reaction. And I thought in that flashpoint moment, I don't have to be that. I don't have to compete with that kind of intellect. I can just like speak from my heart and like feelings about how I feel about the selfless nature of firemen themselves. And I got a tremendous reaction without having to do that. And it was really beautiful, to, incredibly beautiful, actually. Yeah, I love that. And by the way, I just want to say, when I was reading through the book, your storytelling is unbelievable. Like what you do on the screen, the fact that you can do it on the written page is unbelievable. Like, I feel like I got to know people through this book. And that's what I was going to ask you with, with the title Face to Face. What are conversations that in your experience do you believe must happen face to face that today we're not doing because of the distractions of technology or the opportunities of email? What are the conversations that you believe are non-negotiably have to happen face to face? <laughs> I love that. But that, we're, but that we're choosing to do different. <laughs> well, mine with you originally. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I was immediately magnetized to your incredibly powerful eyes. <laughs> um, like, and I even commented. I remember, like, I just couldn't believe the sparkle and clarity of your eyes. And I didn't know that you were. Uh, I didn't fully appreciate that you were a monk, and that completely became compatible to me. I thought, wow, no wonder he had such kind, forgiving eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really, again, very attracted to that. And um, so all of my real curiosity conversations, which incidentally, you know, mine with you, there was a professional nature to it, but I viewed it as a curiosity conversation mm -hmm. because I didn't, you were, inc you were very, very, very well known and particularly by young people. And that's who introduced me to you. But I knew of you, but I didn't know of your massive popularity. And even like today, as I didn't know it was the number one health podcast in the world. It blows my mind. Um, so, I mean, because that's just so powerful. So I think any, any conversation with somebody that you feel matters, you know, like I would go on these curiosity where I still do this every two weeks, meet someone that's expert or renowned in anything I don't do and I they're Nobel laureates they're scientists they're all art forms there were there's Jay <laughs> there's many people and I am um, those conversations must be experienced through eye contact through looking at somebody face to face and that be by that by creating that bridge then you have the privilege to be curious. Then you have the privilege to ask questions. And you have the privilege of creating this amazing kind of alchemy that can happen. And, and all of the great insights that I've ever gleaned have come from these kinds of conversations. And I always just felt like each one of these conversations, yours included, is just like a dot in a greater constellation of dots. And I just have faith that they'll connect someday. Yes. They don't have to directly connect. They can just live in your mind and be part of the way you curate your life. Yes. Um, and so so any of those conversations are essential, um, have to be face to face. Absolutely. And, and it's so fascinating you say that because I feel like I'm not sure I know so many people who make time for curious conversations in their lives. So it's almost like when you say that these are the types of conversations we have to do face to face, I'm almost going through and thinking, how often do we make time for that? Is that something you've made time for forever? Is this a habit that you cultivated and practiced for decades? Yeah. Because I think a lot of people would look at it and be like, oh, Brian, of course you can do that now because you have really cool friends to hang out with. But I'm guessing this is something you've been doing for years and years and years and years. Yeah, I did this, started this the day I graduated college, wow. actually. Um, so I've, I've done it completely dead broke uh, owing people money. So <laughs> just graduating college, uh, owing money on, I don't want to go through it, but, but, and then I've always, I've always done this and I created it as I, as a discipline that I would not fail at, um, you know, I, I would, I would not, I would always do, I'd be obedient to this. And, um, and I would have to grovel and beg and, you know, when on the movie, my very first movie, Splash, I did some other things preceded it. That made me well known, but not well known enough. I mean, I wanted to meet Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb. And, and for a bunch of reasons, I don't have to agree with somebody. I just have to be interested in them or the excellence or their process. But it took 
almost three years for him to finally say yes. Jonah Salt took, I mean, I, years, but I just kept, if you do enough homework, which you have to do, and you're persistent and you're politely persistent, uh, often I would have to wait till like one of their assist that one of those people's assistants had just quit and they have a new person I can actually <laughs> follow to their car or something. I don't know. But so it's no, I've done it for my whole life. Yeah. It's, it's really a way to enlarge in my life. Mm-hmm. So it enlarges my mind, enlarges, enlarges, creates elasticity in me, you know, emotional capability. And then of course it just, you gain these fantastic insights. That, yeah you can transport to something. When me and my team first started partnering with Fully, we became super aware of our work environment and how that affected our health and our mind. We were hunched over desks, we were hunched over the podcast studio, we were doing research, we were on laptops. We could tell that our whole physical and mental space maybe wasn't the best that it could have been. And Fully helped us reimagine our workplace and how we work. Fully transforms the way we feel at work by providing desks, chairs, and all these cool tools and new things that can help keep your body moving and your mind engaged. I really believe that creating an active and comfortable workplace should be a priority for anyone. Most of us spend most of our days at work and making that time productive, effective, and good for your health is so, so important. And Fully does that with a lot more than just standing desks. And by the way, me and my team absolutely love those standing desks but they have so much more to offer. There's active sitting chairs, there's foot mats, there's all sorts of cool things that can actually help you feel far more comfortable in your workplace. Fully can help you reimagine your workplace and what work can feel like. Go to fully.com forward slash J. That's fully, F-U-L-L-Y dot com forward slash J and see what they can do with your space. We absolutely love what they did with ours. So when I'm in the gym, I'm usually listening to Drake. And if I'm on a long walk, I'm listening to one of my favorite podcasts. Either way, earbuds that are comfortable are so important for me. Now, I'm always on the search for premium wireless earbuds, but I'm always looking for ones that aren't that expensive in case I lose one or I misplace one when I'm traveling and in my busy, hectic schedule. Now, if that all sounds familiar to you, I think the Raycon wireless earbuds would be a great match. So the Raycon earbuds start at about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds and the sound is just as great if not better. Raycon's E50 earbuds have without a doubt made traveling, moving around, working around, walking so much more easier and being able to listen so much more comfortable and I've heard even Cardi B's a fan. To get 15% of your order, go to buyraycon.com forward slash on purpose. That's buyraycon.com forward slash on purpose. Get 15% off now. Yeah, no, it comes across. It comes across so genuinely in the way you tell it in the book, but also the way we've connected. And I think that's what everyone who's listening or watching right now, the one thing I'd love for you to do if you're sitting back at home or you're in your car is start scheduling curious conversations, like start finding people that you're curious about, not just professionally, like notice the difference here. It's not about a professional meeting. It's not trying to get a deal. It's not trying to close something. It's about finding someone that you're genuinely interested in that sparks your curiosity. Like you said, could just be a dot that one day might connect. Yeah. And, and I love that. And I'd highly recommend that we schedule more. For me, the podcast is that. Yeah. Like the podcast oh, is, is just like this beautiful yeah. way of just getting to like dive into someone else's mind with no need apart from wanting to learn and grow. So yeah. I, I couldn't agree more that it's powerful. One, one of the things that I'm really intrigued by is uh, one thing that I think you can help us with. We live in a generation today where people's attention spans are just getting squashed. And so today, now you're not competing against another person, you're competing against a phone. So the phone has access, like, can anyone be more interesting than a phone? Because (laughs) a phone has access to everything, right? That's the question. How do you, how have you developed patience to stay interested in someone, even when you're wondering, what is the connection here? I'm not even sure I'm learning. Like, when you're finding it almost difficult, How have you stayed interested in someone when you don't have a common denominator? Because I feel today we look for commonalities and if we don't find it, we're like, well, there's nothing to learn. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. It it makes total sense. Well, um, how do I stay interested? Uh, Well, first of all, you don't have to stay interested. There could be, (laughs) there's a point where 
if you feel like you're forcing it yeah. or they're forcing it, then you don't have to. You know, you just always want to be polite because you. We all want goodwill. We all want the wind blowing to our back. Yes. You know, but um, but it's often it's it's very unique. Like only just before our, our trip, uh, um, about six weeks ago, I had an Uber driver, and I go, I, I said, um, and what's good is they don't initiate conversation. So I will initiate. I said, "Where are you from?" And he said, "He's from Serbia." And so we got into this conversation. It led me to the com- it led me to martial arts. And I said, "Well, I've taken many different martial arts." I mentioned. He goes, "Have you taken this uh, Russian martial arts called Sistema?" I said, "No." So I go, uh, "Will you drive into my house?" So we, instead of just dropping me off, he drove in. I got all of his contacts uh, because he also said that his mother-in-law has seen me before. And anyway, I believed, you know, I, I felt safe, you know. And then um, I then said, "Can I? Can I, will you charge me to teach me this martial arts form called Sistema?" He said he would. So I had him come over. Even I had a broken wrist at the time, and I still did it and learned Sistema, which was a very different kind of a form of martial arts. And I was really glad to do that but I didn't know that would happen um, wow I didn't know that after the Paris terrorist attacks several years ago that 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 uber driver was dropping us off at the at a, the Ritz hotel mm-hmm. and I asked him this question about the tax and I said well I want to know how it made people feel like just how does it make you feel one-on-one on the street not just what the news is mm-hmm. and he said shame and I thought that was really interesting to me. And I understood it because I understood that it meant to them that they don't have the strength themselves to protect themselves. Mm-hmm. So it was about protection because there were victims recently of two terrorist attacks. Yes. So you just learn a lot if you just are open-minded. Yes, yes. So you can <laughs> learn from anyone and everyone. You can learn from every, anyone and everyone. It doesn't everyone. need to be yeah. someone that you've admired or looked up to. It could actually be... Yeah, you just have to not get ahead of yourself and hope that it has some material reason for you. Right. And then, then it kind of happens. Something, something almost always good happens. And you're so right. It, like in your health uh, your podcast, it's like we're living in like, you know, an epidemic of loneliness. It's just accelerating where there's, we are so connected, but the possibility of loneliness is even more because of, of what you just said. Yeah. And the thing that, that you could speak to, I mean, is that everything, there's a metric for it uh, within, our, within our medical system, mm. except internal pain. Mm. And loneliness is, there's pain and you can't measure it. And I just think this, thing of looking at somebody is the beginning of getting out of pain. Yeah. And it might be the beginning of a movie or a television show or or just confidence itself. You know, yes. like having confidence can, can really, you know, is really valuable. Yeah. And let, let's touch on confidence because I think you're so right that like sitting and talking to someone can actually be really like scary and almost feel like you're naked. Like if you feel like someone's looking at you and Especially when, like you said, like you talked about looking at someone, you know, with compassion, without judgment. Without, but often we're looking at people and it's very piercing or, or you feel pierced by people's yes. look. How do we develop, like, okay, stepping in face to face, but how do we kind of break down those barriers that we have of feeling really scared to be looked at or to see? Which I think so many of us have, like we look away when people look at us, like we try and avoid eye, eye contact because we feel kind of nervous by it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I th- I think I think you you would could probably attest to this is that yeah. I mean everybody the number one of the number number one two or three fear is public speaking. Yes. Yeah. I could not. I was well. My first year in college, as a freshman, I was in a public speaking class, and it was 125 kids. His name was Mr. French. I can say this. There's some names I can't say. <laughs> and Mr. French took me aside at the end of the class and he said, I, I really would like to recommend that you discontinue college. Oh, wow. It was like the most discouraging thing. I really, because I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I couldn't public speak. I couldn't speak in this class. So he really thought I should go to an occupational school and discontinue college. And um, 
So that's how acutely, you know, nervous I was. But somebody said to me one day, just think you're, to yourself, like, you're just giving somebody a gift. Mm-hmm. Start off by saying, I'm grateful to be here. Mm-hmm. That will be the beginning of how you can loosen up. I'm grateful to be here. Yeah. I'm grateful you're here having me. And it's the same thing with eye contact. You don't have to say I'm grateful, but you can feel like, you know what? Everyone is feeling what you're feeling. Mm-hmm. If you look at somebody calmly and go, hey, how you doing? Something good will happen. It will be very, very unusual if something good doesn't happen. Yeah. So That's so true. I love that. So I think of it as, as just a nice thing to do. Just a yeah. thing. Oh, 100%. 100%. And I, and I think you're so right that it can be an internal thing. Yeah. It doesn't need to even be verbalized. It doesn't need to be vocalized. It can yeah, be internal. Say it yeah, exactly. absolutely. Absolutely. And when, if you start feeling that, it's kind of like um, I had some very famous guy say to me, I knew you before you made your very first movie, Night Shift. And now you've made all these movies and won Oscars and stuff like that. But I know you, Brian. Have you ever looked in the mirror and kissed the mirror? And I said, no, I haven't. So it just means like, take a minute to love yourself a little bit. Yes. And then give that to other people. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, no, 100%, 100%. And, and I think that that's so much of it, that if we've never looked at ourselves in the eye, it's hard to look others in the eye. Yeah, that, Beca- yeah right? Yeah, like it, yeah. it becomes more complicated. It's like if we've not been able to truly see ourselves, then how can we allow others to see us truly as well? Yeah. And, and and I feel like no you, you've inspired it just now I've never said that before I'm you just, never said it? I've never said that before oh my, my god life. I I've thought you just, must have already I've literally just, that no 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 I've literally just said it right now in this conversation well, that's uh, it's but heavy. yeah it's just you know to, to be truly seen one has to see themselves first yeah. uh, to allow others to truly see you and I, I, I definitely experienced that in uh, there's a beautiful analogy in the Vedic literatures of a mirror of the mind and it said that when we first try and see ourselves, the mirror is very dusty <laughs> and so you can't see yourself. So when you try and wipe the dust, the first thing that happens is the dust comes in your face. And so it's actually quite a, a tough process to start seeing yourself. And then finally, when the dust disappears, you can then see yourself clearly. So a lot of us are going through that dusting phase yeah. of trying to see ourselves clearly. Wow. And therefore the people that we want to show ourselves to, we can't because we're still trying to see ourselves. Yeah. Wow, that's very heavy. I love, I love <laughs> sorry, knowing sorry if it's that. it's too heavy. I love that I, well, I, you know, just like, it's also just as a personal validation. I kind yeah. of felt like what I said to you is what I felt, but yes. now it's further validated by, you know, um, well, I, I, you know, body of work. Well, when I was reading through the book, all I was doing was nodding all the time. But, but uh, what I found different and what I love about the storytelling, and I'm trying not, I, I know you're telling some great stories from there and I want everyone else to go and get the book too, but... The thing in the book is that the way you tell stories is, is it's, it's effortless, but it's also from your deep observation and analysis, right? Like it's, yeah. you, you deeply observe detail yeah. from what people are wearing all the way through to their lips. I think everything it's, matters. Yeah, and it does. And, <laughs> yeah. and that's what I loved about the book. And that's what I'm validating back is that I truly believe that becoming an expert in observation is is everything because it if is. you genuinely are observing the seen and the unseen yeah uh, no that's really smart i love it i like <laughs> i learned from you no no i, no, I love it <laughs> you're inspiring everything we're talking i mean about. you went through the discipline of becoming a monk i yeah which is i and i so admire that it's um but it's it's really true you have to be deeply observational yeah well we'd have the awkward task of having to walk down the same path every day and having to find something new on it yeah like that was one of our tasks like we were told oh. to walk down the same path and have to find something unique every really? time really yes wow and, and it was like it's hard after a while like it sounds easy but after a while no, you really have to look and and i think that's what i'm seeing in that's you is that you're meeting all these people that everyone in your industry meets but you're able to meet them uniquely i do Right? That's yes. what you're I definitely do. Yeah. Many people have met all the people I've met, yes. but, but don't see what I see or feel what I felt from just like could be a millisecond, just some little nuance or a question that they turn away from and you wonder why and it means something. Yeah, absolutely. And How I'm many good. days did you do that particular thing though? That we did for about 30 days. <laughs> so it's like... <laughs> 
And you had to articulate it? Yes, we had to explain every day. And, and often they would, they would play with us in the sense that we were asked to find a new stone every day. And so what you would do, what your, what your material manipulative mind would do is it would find two stones and then you'd say, okay, I'm going to show this one today and tomorrow I'll talk about that one. Oh my and, God. Then, and the next day the monks would say, okay, now we're not looking for stones anymore. We're looking for new flowers. Oh. And, your, and your, your ego mind loses and you're like, oh man, like, you know, and it's just wow. great because it just crushes your, your ego and your manipulative mind to show you that life doesn't work like that. Like wow. you've got to really be present. It's not just about manipulating the answer. Yes. Anyway, so. Yeah. yeah so. You can't start developing patterns and outsmart it. Correct. That's it. Correct. And we think we can, right? Yeah, we think yeah. we can. How have you let go of control in these conversations? I feel like when you're in these difficult meetings or you're in situations, even when there may be a bit, how do you let go of control? Because when I'm reading this, it sounds like you're able to really detach yes. from where things are going and allow it to naturally flow. How have you given up control over these? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, and I know it's, it's take your time yeah. to think about it. I'm just like, well, I think, uh, I, I know what you're saying. Uh, I think I trust that I'll have something to add because I do come to all these conversations prepared. Mm. So know? how do you prepare? Tell me that. that would be well, I would read something about somebody, you know, I would read, but but I, I leave some things unsaid. I knew you were a monk when we met. I knew that you did that. Um, and I knew certain very important facts, uh, although I didn't know there was the number one podcast in the world, <laughs> but, but I knew some very important facts but I wanted to be fresh and have it be real. So when I meet you, I can discover with you mm. and you will say something to me that will lead to something else that I don't know the answer to. Yes. And that becomes really fun and it becomes exciting and, and becomes like, you know, I don't want to sound weird, but it becomes like your best date then. Like you're, <laughs> you're, you're in the zone of something cool, you know, like in that vertical line, but you don't know where it's going. And, how it's gonna, how it's gonna produce life. Yeah. And so that's really fun for me. Um, I, you know, I am scared sometimes of if there's nobody, t if, if it's silent, mm. but I just get through that. <laughs> <laughs> how do you, yeah, how do you deal with awkward silences and conversations? I think that's something that everyone who's listening right now knows that whether you're on a date or you're at dinner with friends, yeah. there's so many awkward silences and you're sitting with hugely influential people yeah. and there's those awkward silences how do you uh, navigate those i'm not beyond like groveling go i might just go like oh come on what are you thinking about yeah. or and if i get nothing then i'll say i'll do the i will i will turn a fact into a question i'll go huh. did you know the following thing did you know that song from gucci main just dropped last week or i'd say um i was just i went to the atacama desert and have you ever been? They go, no. And they just, no. I go, well, I went because <laughs> I was searching for the greatest night sky in the world. And my wife said, it, there's two places. And one of them is the Atacama Desert mm. in uh, Northern Chile. So we went to it. Wow. Or I could say, everyone can go like, how's your family? Where's your vacation? What do you yes. like to eat? Yes. What do you hate to eat? You, it's, you can go. You can invent yeah. stuff. Yeah. And this is part of what you're saying. Like, I feel like there's such a need for us to become better conversationalists. Yes. There, and, yes. and I feel like we've started talking in abbreviations yeah. and acronyms because of social media. So like, so I, I, like, you know, like you would, it's such a normal thing when your partner is out to message them and just say milk. Like you would just say milk in a message and they know that that means get milk. Yeah. And you know what that means. But then when you turn that into a conversation and you start talking and like you see them walk out the door and you're like milk. <laughs> with nothing else. And with nothing milk. else. And it's like so much of our conversation gets shrunk into abbreviations yeah. and acronyms. Yes, it does. And, and no just, doubt for just sure. Just stuff. And I'm just like, but there is a need. What I feel you're doing is you're telling us to expand our vocabularies and our minds to actually dive into a real conversation and stop talking like we do on yeah. small text trust that an act trust that an actual conversation will produce something of value yeah you don't have to know what it is but i guarantee it will produce something of value even if it's awkward at first yeah and even i love preparation awkward. and trust i think those are great practical takeaways for everyone listening that preparation and trust together yes is a beautiful synergy yeah you have to do preparation yes you because do because then you're not 
that's not fair to the person you're calling up or correct. texting or emailing. Can I meet you? You have to do some preparation. Yeah, correct, correct. And there's no shortcuts. Yeah, and just for everyone's information, this is the research we do for all our guests. Like we go and oh, dive wow. in. Like it's prepared, and 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 at the same time, I love the reason why I'm validating preparation and trust is that's how I approach this conversation. If we're very prepared, we're very researched. But at the same time, I just want to have a real exchange. Yes. And so I'm not tied to that framework. Yeah. But the framework gives you a foundation to then build on. Yeah. Right. I mean, look, look. There are times. Yes. There are times where I'm interviewing somebody, and I know their body of work, but I, they they just written a book, and I sometimes say to my wife Veronica, "Should I tell them I read it?" And then. We always conclude no. <laughs> Say, I heard about it. I heard it was amazing, but I haven't had a chance to read it. Yes. Um, but you can choose whatever you want to choose. That's my choice because I don't want to get busted. Yeah. Uh, because then it just kind of undermines the whole thing. So yeah, absolutely. Um, so you can't do everything, mm -hmm. but you can do enough. You can do something. Mm -hmm. You know, you can. Mm -hmm. We can all prepare a little. Yes. Yeah. I love that. One of, one of the things that fascinates me about your work is this theme of redemption. Yeah, like this consistent theme that keeps coming back up, and I think that with communication, even within face-to-face -face communication, redemption is such a need in our lives. Yeah, because I think we I think so. we regret what we've said, we uh, feel pain by what we've said or heard from others. Like communication has so much weight to it when it's been done negatively. That redemption is something that we all need. Where does that? Why is that theme so striking for you? And and how have you seen that kind of play out in your work? Well, okay, so redemption. Um, well, first of all, my goal with making movies or television shows or whether it's Friday Night Lights where they lose the game originally in the movie or you don't always have to win at things. Mm. Um, but it's good. I've, redemption to me would be, uh, a, you know, an emotional resolution that is a plus. So you don't have to get the girl, you just have to do your best. You don't have to get the girl, you just have to have dignity. You just, in other words, I, I just want either the movies or television or shows or documentaries and, you know, um, Pavarotti, which we just finished, it wasn't a perfect person, but there's redemption in Pavarotti. So I want to show that. I want, I want people to, I want to send out good vibes into the world, <laughs> yeah. however it goes. Even if it's just me saying, hey to somebody, hey, like, or um, I don't want to, I, there's so many examples. I, sure, sure. I just want to have good vibes, good vibes out there. I, I, I realized, um, this is a big digression, but I, I kind of learned the message of this when, as a, first of all, as a kid, I'd have my parents periodically take me to a movie. And it was always like a huge drag to get in the car. It was very inconvenient. Then my dad would be mad because he couldn't find a parking spot. And then all of a sudden there's bad vibes. And then we have to wait in line. And then we get our ticket. And then we have to put our sweaters down or someone has to save the seats while someone gets the food. Da, da, da. Anyway, before the movie even starts, the whole theater, the auditorium is usually kind of tense and bad vibes. Mm. So that was my memory of the movie going experience. Of course, I loved all those James Bond movies and stuff. Nonetheless, that's what I remember. And then I remember the same thing happened when you got out, trying to get your car to the parking spot, all that stuff. I see the movie E.T. <laughs> in the Cinerama Dome, this famous theater in Hollywood. Actually, we're quite it's close to it. I, I've been there, yeah, it's yeah. been there. I just saw and it was very new at the time. And all the same things were happening, hard to park, da 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 and I'm thinking, oh my God, the movie's over. I sort of thought, well, of course people are gonna step on my feet. I'm just a little guy, da 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 It was so strange. Everybody, the whole vibe was really good. Nobody pushed, no rush to the car. The energetics of the entire auditorium had changed, had transformed to something else. And I thought, wow, that's amazing if I can be some way have that be my goal to try to make movies or television shows that make you feel better you know yeah um because that gives you confidence and it and confidence gives you the ability to hatch new ideas and you know so 
So that's kind of how redemption factors into it. And the movie, like, 8 Mile that I produced about a rapper, you know? I've watched that movie way too many times. <laughs> that's cool. Eminem's behind that. You can't see it oh, right I now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, I see, I see. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, so, I'm I mean, a huge you know, Eminem fan, so. So, yeah. And so <laughs> that movie's not like a man beat. You know, it's not a, it's not, it's, you know, it's a serious movie. You know, it's intense. There's you know words and this and that and uh it, there was, there's acts of violence and stuff but ultimately it's an aspirational film mm -hmm. it's a movie about a kid that had to become self-actualized to sur emotionally survive mm -hmm. it wasn't even about him going off to be the biggest hip-hop star in the world in fact that isn't what happens in the story of the movie he just was able to say, yeah, I am white trash, mm -hmm. liberate himself from all his emotional injuries so that he could actually look at people and know himself and dust off the mirror, as you said. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, it, it's there's all these different sizes, shapes, and forms in which you can do that. Yeah, no, and I love that, and I definitely got that message from that movie. I mean, I must have watched that movie growing up, I don't know, like a million times. And yeah. It's like every time I watched it personally, it just gave me more permission to be myself. Oh. Like that's what I was getting from See, it. that's cool, yeah. It's like permission to be yourself because that's what you see his character, yeah. B. Rabbit, go through of just getting permission to then finally stage on, say, be on stage and not be better or be worse, yeah. but just be yourself. Yes. And I think that that's, that's brilliant. to me, where that's human great. connection starts is when permission. you give yourself permission to be yourself and you give someone else the permission to be themselves without judgment, ambition, all the other stuff you mentioned of just without like crowding it into like you having to be a certain way, them having to be a certain Yeah. Way. Well, that's so well said because that is sort of like thinking of your best date or your best <laughs> meeting with somebody, even just a business meeting, your best meeting is when that happens, yeah. right? When those guards go down and yeah. both people feel permission to be themselves. But I, I thought you did that. When I first met you, obviously I'd, uh, some of you, the movies you've made are some of my favorite movies. Rush too is, one of my favorite movies. I love that movie. And it's, for me, those have been, and so when I got the opportunity to meet you and my team had mentioned to me that we could meet, I, you know, for me, it was like, I was like, wow, I'm meeting someone that I've like admired for a long time, really look up to you. I was nervous because I was meeting someone that, you know, that that's important to me in some context. And, and it's just, you were so good at helping me be myself because the first thing I think you said to me when I came to your home was just like, oh yeah, I've been listening to you all week. And like, you're like, oh, I've been listening to your YouTube videos and I heard you say this. And I was just like, oh, wow. Like, I just feel yeah. at ease because someone's given me context that they've, they're aware of yeah. what I'm doing and, and they're meeting me. And, and I just felt, wow, someone who's so busy, someone who has so many huge things going on, had the time to do that. Yeah. And I'm like, if you've got the time to do that to make someone like me feel at ease, then for me, we've all got time to do that yeah. for, for everyone that we meet, you know? And so often I think, we have meetings where we've done no preparation for the person. Yeah. Someone walks into a room and you're like, all right, so tell me why you're here, right? And it's like, it's horrible. you're like always it? pitching yourself. And it's yeah. like, I think people don't want to pitch themselves. To, to... You're not your best when you're pitching yourself. No. Yeah. And, and I think there's a pressure to pitch yourself. And I love being in scenarios where I'm not pitching myself because that's when I can truly give myself permission. I feel you really did that for me oh, when we met. And I thought that was a beautiful thing to point out because I feel the fact that you did that for me, I'm, I'm hoping people listening and watching, we can all do that for everyone in our lives. Yes, yeah, Just giving people can. that. Yeah. What a memory you have, because I do remember before the day we met, a lot of people said, oh my God, you're meeting Jay Shetty, <laughs> and then on and on. And it was like all diverse groups of people are going, oh, you're meeting Jay, oh, you're meeting Jay. And I thought, wow, I've really missed out by not meeting Jay, clearly. So then um, Jamie said, okay, you know, whatever day it was, so I crash course in like the last three, the three days prior yeah, to this yeah. meeting, I watched and listened to so many of your pieces. And I thought, wow, I get it. You know, like I actually very kind. was able to, well, it was very easy to connect into, into you. So, um, uh, yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. But no, I, I really felt that. And I think that that's such a powerful thing to do that for someone is to help them. I think sometimes we have to let our guards down, but we have to help other people let their guard down too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that is an environment and a space that we create, which I think you create. And I think that's why so many of the most successful people in the world that are mentioned in this book are able to do that with you as well. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think it's special. Well, the thing I did do, another thing, I have, like, I have so many stories. <laughs> yeah, everything. go for it. But when I started my career and I, got, and I all of a sudden, I, I had, uh, you know, some power and money and all that, you know, I was very aware of powerful men for the most part 
having that elevated desk when you walked in to see that. <laughs> I mean, all those Hollywood cliches are really true. <laughs> you know, you'd go in to see, like in the day, you know, there was Sam Goldwyn or, you know, Louis B. Mayer. I, I mean, it was very long before me, or Daryl Zanuck. And they had known to have elevated desks, you know, yeah. like, so when you walked in, you felt smaller mm. um, and you sat across the desk. And and even in my time in the 1990s, it was still carried out that way. Guys that were really powerful, they all had black, black vinyl furniture, like really lethally tough black stuff. And um, and I remember thinking, I'm gonna do just the opposite. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna even have a desk. Or I had one way off in the distance and everything was always like sitting around a very democratic kind of a vibe where it's like a coffee table, a big L-shaped couch, and you just sit and chill because you get the best out of artists when they're not scared. Yes. So I thought I, that's the that's the way I'm going to get my competitive edge. Yes. Not by intimidating somebody and making them certain that they know that I'm powerful. I'm going to do just the opposite. Love that. That's awesome. So. That's so beautiful. And you did the Alphas meeting was at your home. Yeah, like, yeah. I was like, true. well, okay, I'll pull it out. You know, and I just think that you, you really live that. And I think that's amazing because I, I always feel that the people that change culture are the people that change culture. Like you have to change the culture to be someone who makes a difference. And I think today so many people are scared because they're following the rules. Like they see their agent treat the younger agent badly so they think when I become the senior agent that's what I'm gonna have to do yeah. and I think we just perpetuate that culture we don't break cycles and we don't break generational curses right like we just let them perpetuate and it's amazing yes, to I see agree. you yeah. just like go no I'm I'm gonna change that <laughs> what gave you the courage to like what gave you the boldness to to do that um well look I like everybody else want to feel special mm -hmm. I want to earn my right I want to earn you know, I want to earn feeling special. Yeah, true. and I want to, and I want to be acknowledged for it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there was a time where, like, the five main big producers, all four of them, all looked sort of similar. You know, they had, they did action films. They're very aggro. Um, they yelled at assistants and stuff, and you know, they were very aggressive. Threw plates of food on them. There's a lot of famous stories. Now, I don't even want to say that I'm better than that. I was just different than that. I'm not mm. constructed. I don't have a lot of sort of confrontational mm. stuff going on in me uh, in that way. So I thought, how am I going to have a nick? Do I need a nickname or <laughs> how do I do this? Um, and I and I quite honestly, I, a lot of them had you know beards. I can't, I could not grow a beard quite honestly. So I thought, how am I going to do it? So I did want to you know have something. And so that's when I sort of popped my hair up because my daughter Sage thought, oh, that looked great. We're in a swimming pool. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, that could be different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, so, but I, I didn't really, you know, um, I, I just kind of felt like, and my career started with making a mermaid. Yes, yeah. I mean, if my if my career started by with an action film or it started with um, something that was less risky you know less against the system or yeah. you know like it seemed less crazy like everyone thought a mermaid movie is if you're gonna pick what could be a dumb idea that would be the dumb idea yes so i had a lot of people hundreds of people sort of say that was a very bad idea and so the fact that it worked validated this sort of movement for myself to just continue to try my finding my authentic self trust the theme that lives inside of that authentic self and have that be transported in to movies or television mm -hmm. that I do. And so most of my movies and television shows, the ones that I work on, that certainly that work have a theme. And usually the theme is rooting for love, mm -hmm. rooting for friendship, brotherhood is always a thing to me, you yeah, know. Um, and self-respect and identity is critical. Mm. You know, it's the avoidance of shame. Yeah. So many movies are kind of access around respect. You know, having men, men want to feel respected. We all want to feel respected. Women want to feel respected. Yeah. And so you have to allow people to have that identity. Um, and that's the good things will come from it.
Amazing. That's beautiful, Brian. We end every interview with a final five. Ooh, wow. This is a rapid fire, quick fire round. Okay. So answers have to be one word to one sentence maximum. Uh, that's a cap. And I will probably okay. I will probably okay. make you expand on stuff, but but okay. we'll try and stick I'll, to that. I'll this, try it. This okay. is your final five I'll try round. It. So yes. the first question is the movie you've rewatched the most. Godfather. Okay, nice. Second question. What is one movie you wish you created? Um Oh my, oh God, what is that? With Michael J. Fox. I love that movie. Uh, 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 you know what it is. Back to the Back future. To, uh, sorry. <laughs> Back to the future. Because I had made many, many. Oh, sorry. I'm going to stop. Back no, to the future. I wish no, I would. No, carry on. <laughs> well, because I had produced a lot of hit comedies, but when Back to the Future was made and I saw it, I thought, wow, yeah. that blows my mind. That takes comedy to a whole other level. I just thought the intricacy, the genius, to create something, you know, retrofit back that story was brilliant. I thought it was really brilliant. I wish I could have made that movie. Amazing. Question yeah. number three. If you could have a conversation, a curious conversation with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? Someone you haven't spoken to yet. I would really love, love to meet, really have a conversation with the Pope. Oh, this, wow. the, With the Pope. Okay, side question, not one of the final five. What would okay. you ask him? What would be one question that you'd ask him? How does he have the strength and ability to change which is almost an inflexible system? Nice, yeah, amazing. Okay, great. I'm sure we can dive into that on another day too. Uh, question number four, what's one of your favorite scenes from the House of Cards? Because I know you like the show. Oh my God, I do love <laughs> House of Cards. Uh, I don't have a favorite scene, Fine. Uh, but I, I do like, I did like when Kevin Spacey would become so evil, so badass that it's shocking. You know, I guess, I like things that are unpredictable and he he and that became unpredictable. So Amazing. And I liked it. It was a big surprise to me because I offered Robin Wright to be in A Beautiful Mind. I think she's an amazing actress. Mm. Um, but she declined and uh, I shouldn't say that. But anyway, <laughs> she did. And I've always been a big fan because she's brave and she's, she, she's super badass in that show. Yeah, I love it. And the final and fifth question oh, yeah. of the final five is... If you could give one message to everyone listening, what would that be if you had to give a final message to everyone listening? It's a one step to look at somebody in the eyes. Please do it. Amazing. I love it. How beautiful. What a beautiful message to give to people. Just uh, forget FaceTime, forget messaging, get in front of people, get face to face, have more curious conversations have conversations without ambition that line is going to stick with thank me the you. rest of my life I'm so happy that is such a beautiful way of putting it thank you so much brian You're welcome and for everyone who's been listening and watching thank you so much for tuning in today i highly recommend that you go and get the book face to face the art of human connection it's in bookstores right now you can uh, order it online too and we'll put the link into the comment section so you can order it straight from our feed. Make sure you go get the book if you want to hear about stories. And what I love about this book is there are lots of people in our lives that we may never get to have curious conversations with ourselves. But it's people like Brian who bring those curious conversations into our lives. So there are a host of people in this book that you'd love to speak with and you may never get to speak with face to face, but Brian has and he's asked them incredible questions and you get to read about all of them in the book. So in the same way as I always say, I feel mentored by Steve Jobs even though I never met him because <laughs> I've studied everything he's ever said, you will find the same mentorship and insight in this book. So I highly recommend that you go and get face to face by Brian Grazer. Brian, it's been an honor and my pleasure to have you here today in my home and also to interview you. And I'm excited for our relationship to continue. I'm excited for more conversations. Me too. I'm so grateful. I, yeah. I loved, you're brilliant. I loved how this turned out. It was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. brilliant. Thank Me too. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Perfect. Yeah. Thank right. you.